Coastal Rivers Conservation Trust. Located at the Round Top Farm in Damariscotta, the mission of Coastal Rivers Conservation Trust is to care for the lands and waters of the Damariscotta Pemaquid region by conserving special places, protecting water quality, creating trails and public access, and deepening connections to nature. Coastal Rivers Conservation Trust. CoastalRivers.org. Welcome to the David Moses Bridges Education Hall and Coastal Rivers Conservation Trust. My name is Sarah Gladue. I'm the Director of Education and Community Science. And it's lovely to have you all join us. A great evening. Um, I'm sure you're going to have a wonderful time meeting, where is she, jo Jody, <laughs> and talking about her new book. So thank you so much to Valerie Seibel and Tim Dinsmore, respective leaders of our local um, historical societies in Newcastle uh, and Damascotta and Newcastle and uh, oh the other way around thank you okay. I, I get them confused <laughs> that's right um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Tim uh, Valerie first. to Valerie have a great time thank you I want to thank you all for being here this afternoon it's was uh, hard to come inside today, so I'm glad we've got such a great turnout. And uh, thank you to Tim for helping out with the Newcastle Historical Society and of course, Coastal Rivers. So after the presentation, we have a lot of refreshments over here and a place for donations. And also we have a fundraiser. We're selling some Betsy's Fancy Fudge, if anybody needs a Mother's Day present. <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, anyway, um, Tim's gonna say a few words and then I think we can start. Okay. Thank you all for coming. I just wanted to say um, that the Jammer Scott and Newcastle Historical Societies have a shared history. It doesn't matter which side of the town you're on, the river separates us, but people worked in one town and lived in the other. And so uh, we uh, will often, well, from time to time, we'll have shared talks uh, for the public. And I uh, just want to thank you all for turning out. Um, Jody Vashelder has done a tremendous amount of research on Samoset, which a lot of people I know have heard of Samoset from New Harbor and the Wabanaki uh, uh, in the Wabanaki in general, um, and John Brown. And she has done a tremendous amount of primary and secondary research. She spoke, she's spoken to archaeologists, historians, local people as well, and she's going to take us through her research. And the book is excellent. I read it, and I oh, highly thanks. recommend it. And there's some up here for sale. <laughs> so please give a warm welcome to Jody Batchelder. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> wow, thank you. OK, it's going to be very hard for me not to stand in front of that. OK. And I'm sorry I'm going to be behind you, I think. so. Wow, this is fantastic. Thanks to these three organizations for playing so nicely together <laughs> and bringing us all together. So I, that's fantastic. So thank you for the nice introduction. Thank you all for coming in on a beautiful day. I feel a little sorry that you, uh, this is the one good day we've had and here you are inside. Is the microphone okay? Okay, good, all right. Um, I just wanna warn you ahead of time. I have a tendency to get talking. Um, I'm going to run through some history here. So hopefully you came here for a history talk today. If you didn't, you better run. Uh, and it takes me about an hour and 10 minutes if I talk fast to get through all of this. But I, there's so much I, I, uh, I hate to leave out. So um, if you need to get up and stretch and get some air, I will not be offended, and neither will anybody else. So it's understood. So welcome, everybody. And again, and thanks for coming. Um, You've probably seen these. I want to start with a land acknowledgement to the Wabanaki, the, the indigenous people, who lived here for probably at least 12,000 years. Uh, they took care of this land. They took care of the resources on the land. And what's nice in where we are today is when I go out and do talks in other parts of the state, I have to figure out who the indigenous people were that lived in that area. But this was the Wabanak, so that makes it so easy for me. Um, so uh, I want to kind of just tell you how I sort of came to be here today. 
I'm not a history scholar. I'm not a historian. I'm actually a librarian by training. Um, and it just so happened, my husband had a job out of state. I had to leave my job. And what was I going to do? Well, you know, I'm going to write a book. Why not? <laughs> so I originally was going to write a book about Samoset for children. This was going to be a picture book. And then something happened. Things blew up. And it became this 250-page <laughs> history book for adults. And that's because I kind of ended up writing it as I learned it. Because I, you know, I'm a little embarrassed to say that even though I grew up in New Harbor, <laughs> Samoset's hometown, um, I didn't know any of this history. Um, we didn't really learn in school, and I don't blame teachers for that. There were not a lot of resources. And this was all new to me. What did it, I mean, I could ask you what you know about Samoset. It's probably the same thing I did when I started. I knew we walked into Plymouth Plantation, and I knew there was something about a land deed, and that's really where I was starting. And even worse than that, I really knew pretty much nothing about the, the, the history, this time period. So we're talking about the first half of the 1600s um, is when he lived. And what a time that was to be alive because everything would change. So um, I just wanted to put that out there that, you know, you're reading, you're reading a book by another person like yourself. Um, and I want to make sure you, you recognize that I'm not an indigenous person. Um, it would obviously be better if a Wawanok person could tell this story. But we're going to see over the course of this hour or so, uh, the Wawanok don't live here now. And we'll find out why, what happened to them. Um, but it was really important for me to have a couple of Wabanaki people read the manuscript. So I asked two historians to do that, which was a good thing, because they saved me a, a lot of embarrassment of things I might have gotten wrong. Um, they could point out when I was getting something culturally wrong. So that was, that was excellent, and I appreciate their help. But I thought it would help. Can you see that OK? I realize these slides are not going to be that easy for you to read. This is a map of Wabanaki country. I thought it might be helpful to get our bearings as to who were, the wa were and are the Wabanaki. So um, this map shows you the territory which spans about Nova Scotia to the east all the way to Vermont in the west. That's considered Wabanaki country. And now this term Wabanaki, you probably have heard this. It translates into English as the Dawnland, or where the sun rises, of course. And the Wabanaki are the people of the Dawnland. And that term actually, I mean, that, that word has always been around, but it wasn't really used to describe this group of people until after Samoset died. So this would have been late in the 1600s. There were incursions by Mohawk coming into the area, and that's when they kind of came together as a unified force to fight off the Mohawk, and they sort of called themselves the Wabanaki Confederacy. Now, you hear, when you hear Wabanaki, that term today, that refers to the Mi'kmaq on the east, and then the Maliseet live up along the St. John River, and today that spans both Canada and Maine. And then you have the Passamaquoddy, who are down east, the Penobscot, who live on the Penobscot River, and then you had everybody else. Now, we collectively refer to those people, all those tribes, and there were many, many tribes, the Wawanak just being one, those are the Abenaki. And I know that's confusing. Wabanaki, Abenaki, what's the deal? Um, but we'll see why, because they are in a bit of a different situation. The Abenaki are not federally recognized, whereas the others are. Uh, but they are all collaborative and, and work together. So hopefully that kind of makes some sense. And if you have more questions, I can help you out. But the Wawanak, we're, we're about in the central part of where their territory was. So they lived in the mid-coast of Maine. Um, on the western part of their boundary would have been the Kennebec River, and then all the way to the St. George River, so close to Penobscot Bay. And they lived all along the coast. And we think, actually, that Wawanak means people of the Bay Country. So yeah, obviously, by looking at that geography, you can see that's a very apt name. Um, and we can also see how important water was to the Wawanak, living on the ocean, 
all those wonderful rivers we have, all the beautiful lakes we have in this country, in, in this state, I mean, and they used that resource for everything. Um, that's how they got their food, fishing. Um, fishing and, and also food from the ocean, from the lakes, the ocean, the, the rivers. And also it was their transportation. So they got around by canoe all over their territory. And one of the things, many things in this journey astounded me, but one of the first things that struck me was how mobile they were, how far afield they went from home. We know Samoset was in Casco Bay. He was probably in Penobscot territory in Penobscot Bay. Uh, that's a long way to go in a canoe, in a birch bark canoe. They would paddle out to Monhegan Island. That's about 12 miles offshore, and if you've ever been on the ferry to Monhegan, you know that that can be a bit of a rough ride. Yeah. So, you know, try to imagine the skill it took to do that in a birch bark canoe that they had built. Um, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of an overview of the Wawanak themselves. Now, we think it's hard to know because, you know, there's only so much of this history that's been written down. But it's, it's probable that the Wawanak first met the English in, about, in 1605. There was an explorer. His name was uh, Captain George Weymouth. And he came here in 1605. And he came to look for a place to build a colony. He had some rich investors at home who had sent him here. They wanted to set up a colony. and. They wanted him to find goods to trade, stuff to make them rich, stuff that they had over-harvested at home in England. Now, we're talking about fish and trees, timber for burning and for, for shipbuilding, whale oil. They'd pretty much decimated their whale population. Um, sassafras trees, interestingly, they thought sassafras was a cure for syphilis. <laughs> so they needed those. Um, <laughs> and furs, especially beaver furs, and you may already know this, that beaver fur can be felted and they made them into hats. And everybody wanted a beaver fur hat. So that was a very hot commodity. And of course, the holy grail would have been gold or silver. Always explorers were looking for precious minerals. They wanted to be rich like the Spanish had been lucky enough to find, uh, or the native people, showed them where the gold and silver were there. And they always hoped to find that here. So the Wawanak probably saw Weymouth's ship. He had anchored in Muscungus Bay, uh, in what we now call the George's Islands. Um, so you know, they see this foreign ship. They paddle their canoes out five miles to the George's Islands. And they approach the ship. Um, so uh, it seems, based on the information that we have, and we are so lucky to know about this, uh, I always think it's extraordinary that any of this survived. But one of the men on the expedition, whose name was James Rosier, wrote a book about it. And you can read it online if you like. And it's really interesting, actually. So we know about their interactions with the Wawanak. It's amazing to me. So the first interaction went well. And um, James Rosier wrote some Fun facts in his book, that they loved sugar candy. Um, they didn't like alcohol, though. They, they gave them alcohol, and they spit it out. That was nasty. Um, he was fascinated by how they made their clothing, how clever is that to make it in pieces so you can take off the leggings when it's too hot, that sort of thing. Um, he asked them if he could use his, the, try out their bow. And he write, writes about how um, impressed he was by their craftsmanship, how good they were at building a bow. And then he goes on to say, and that's the last bit of this quote, that they are a people of exceeding good invention, quick in understanding, and ready capacity. So I just want you to remember that, because when he writes his book, he refers to them as savages. <laughs> and yet here he's just written about how intelligent and resourceful they were. But the term savages, and I that's the air quotes, uh, was always used on purpose. <coughs> This was the term that you used to subjugate other human beings, to make them seem like they are somehow less human than you are. And this was done on purpose. This was how European nations would go out and build their empires. Uh, they would convince themselves that these people were uncivilized because they weren't Christians, and they could do what they want. 
And in fact, you may know this, this term, the doctrine of discovery. You may have heard this. That's sort of the, uh, the policy. It came from the Catholic Church. So there were popes in the 1400s who wrote these edicts that said to Europeans, you may go out and you may go to foreign lands and if you find people living there who are not Christians, white Christians like we are, then you can take the land and you can do what you would like with the people. So um, I, I, I've put up this TED talk, which I think is really interesting, by an indigenous person who looks at the doctrine of discovery from the indigenous point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really interesting to flip things on their head and look at things from a different point of view. At the end of the talk, I'll tell you how you can get to that. Um, and um, I inserted this little sign. Somebody didn't know how to spell rescind, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> rescind the doctrine of discovery. So this, was from this, this notion, this policy, has been out there since the 1400s. And the Catholic Church has never walked it back. They never rescinded or repudiated it until this, just this past March. <laughs> Indigenous people have been after the Catholic Church asking for decades please say something about this. And Pope Francis finally did. I don't know if you happen to notice that in the news, but so there seems to be some progress. Uh, anyway, this is a very, it's like a 17 minute TED talk and I found it very interesting. How's that diversity working out for you? <laughs> he wanted to know how that diversity is working out. <laughs> so the Wawanop met with the English. They hung out together for several days. They shared some meals together. They shared a nice, friendly smoke. Uh, Rosier notes that they used the lobster claw for their pipe. I thought that was a fun little fact. Um, they, uh, they got very comfortable. The Wawanok apparently were thinking, OK, these people mean to be friendly. This is going well. And then one day, the English kidnapped five of them and took them home to England with them. And you know, that sounds like it was just like that, and it was just like that. One day they were friends, the next day they weren't. Um, I'm sure that they were fairly easy prey because I don't think they expected this to happen. And, but they must have felt so incredibly betrayed by that. Um, and they assumed that these men had, the other Wawanak assumed the men had been murdered. I mean, what else would they think? They've disappeared and they think that they've been killed by these foreigners. So that starts things sort of off really on a bad footing. Um, and we know that the men who were taken, Rosier writes down their names, so I think that's wonderful we know who they are. They're Tahanado, Amorat, Skikaweros, Manado, and Sasakomowit. Uh, Tahanado was the Sagamore, so he was the leader of the tribe. And um, I, that's kind of a, just a cool thing to know. Um, and this was apparently not an unusual thing. If you read, other journals from early explorers, you find that it was pretty often part of their mission was to take captives back home with them. Now, there were probably lots of reasons for that. Um, it, was a, it was one way to prove that they'd actually been here. If they bring back this person, they can, you know, obviously they'd been to this country. Uh, a lot of times they would just sell them off as slaves to make money from them. Sometimes they would just take them up and down the street and sort of show them off like a carnival act. Um, so they were treated in lots of different ways. Um, I don't think these Wawanak were ever meant to be sold off as slaves, though. I think that they were taken with the idea that they would be brought back here, they would learn the language, and they could become interpreters and guides and a liaison to the other tribes for when the English would come back and build a colony because that was the plan. You know, even after taking some of their people, betraying them, they were going to come back and they were going to build a colony. So they, you know, that's a little bit of arrogance, but that's just the way they thought. So the five men were taken to England, and this is an illustration of London at the time. So a, a pretty big, sophisticated city. About 200,000 people lived in London then. Um, I like to think about what it must have been like for the Wawanok to be taken from their environment where they're using stone tools. Uh, there is no metal in their lives. They have not smelted metal to make any kind of tool with. Um, and they would have never have seen a multi-story building 
or a bridge that went across a river. They were seeing things that just didn't exist in their world. Horses, cows, oxen, those animals didn't exist in, this, you know, in North America. All of this stuff, people with different skin color didn't exist in their world. So I, the technologies must have seemed in rather incredible. Harpsichords and eyeglasses and clocks, all of these things would have been new. And here they were plunked down into the middle of this. Um, three of them were left in Plymouth, England, where they first um, <coughs> where they first landed, and they went to live with a man named Sir Ferdinando Gorges. And I don't, you've probably never heard that name, unless you've heard of Gorges Fort in Casco Bay, named for him. But this man, who I knew nothing about when I started, like so many other things, had a huge influence on the history of Maine. <coughs> huge influence. Basically, it's Sir Ferdinando that kind of created the environment for what Maine would become. So three of those captives went to live with him, and the other two went on to London and went to live with Sir John Popham. Now, you've probably heard that name because this would become the Popham colony in Phippsburg. I don't know if you've ever, anybody ever been there? You, that's amazing because it's really hard to find. Yes, I actually one of the archaeologists. <laughs> Tim was one of the archaeologists. Yay! Um, so, I mean, it's, it's very hard to find, but if you can, and I hear that the state's working on some new signs to make it easier to find, that would be great. Uh, it's really cool to go there because archaeologists have figured out where things were, so we know where they set up this colony, which is kind of a bad location, actually. It's the mouth of the Kennebec River, kind of set up on a bluff, it was really cold, <laughs> uh, and it was one of the worst, coldest winters in history that anybody could remember. And if you've ever been there in June, you know that the bugs are horrible. It must have been a miserable. So this was the location that they had chosen. Um, that's all good. But the, the Popham colony is, is the colony nobody's ever heard of because it didn't last more than a year. It was started the same year as the Jamestown colony. And of course, they get the glory because they survived. But the Popham colony is so important, actually, to our history. And it's a fascinating chapter. I find this so interesting to learn about. And this was one of an aha moment in my research to, to realize that the Wawanok were so connected to this colony. Actually, they are integral to the history of this colony. So I found it fascinating that they would go and visit this colony twice. And they were seeking out a relationship with the English. So I got to asking myself, why would they do that? You know, these people had betrayed them. They had forcibly, violently kidnapped some of their people. Why would they see, why didn't they just run them off or kill them? You know, they were in a position of power. They could have done that. Well, it turns out there were very good reasons for everything that they did. And this may be something else you hadn't heard of. I had not, which is the Micmac War. They were at war when the, colonists arrived, they had been at war for a month. The Micmac War started in July 1607, and it was a war between, if you remember the Wabanaki map, the, the Micmac are in Nova Scotia, were fighting against all of the tribes and the coastal part of Maine. And they, <laughs> they got in their flotilla of canoes and paddled all the way down the coast, so it was about 400 miles. And remember I said it was really impressive how good they were in their boats, to wage war against these tribes. And the tribes along the coast of Maine had come together sort of in an alliance. This was called the Mawushan Alliance. My sister's here today, so I can say this. Our mother went to the Mawushan School when she was little in, in New Harbor Hill. Uh, so you don't hear that name very often, but that was what this group was called. They came, so the Micmac came all the way down the coast to, to wage war in Saco. That's when the first battle happens, July 1607. So that's kind of an extraordinary thing right there. Uh, now the Micmac lived with some of the uh, other Europeans who had come to this, um, to this country, and those were the French. They had already built a small colony in Nova Scotia. Uh, and they were basically taking over the territory 
that was east of where the Wamanak lived. So everything that was Penobscot territory east would be French territory. And everything sort of west of that, and there was a lot of fighting about the in-between parts, was English territory. And this will be a very, very important thing. So you've already guessed, if you've looked at this illustration, um, when the Mi'kmaq came down to, to fight in that battle, they pulled out a secret weapon, which was guns. Now, I can't stress how important I think this moment was in Wabanaki history. I think this was an absolute turning point for them because I don't think warfare was new among Wabanaki people. I mean, people are people, they fight with each other. But the way that war was waged after this would change forever. Because during that battle in Sako, 20 Sako warriors were killed. And apparently that was a very extraordinary, extraordinarily high number. You know, you can't survive a gunshot wound very easily. Well, <laughs> now things are different. And that takes us back to why the Wawanuk would make that 20 mile trip from Pemaquid to the Popham colony to seek out a relationship with the English. That quote that you see, if you can read it, shows us that they were involved in this war. Um, one of the men on the expedition, the Popham Colony expedition, kept a journal. So we're so lucky to have that. And he mentions this random meeting that the colonists have with the Wawanak. They just run into Tahanado on the Sheepskit River, sort of randomly. Ah, there he is. And they are just returning from a, a battle. And so we know that they were engaged in this war. Now, Sambaset, we believe, was probably born around 1590. We don't know for sure. That would put him at about 17 years old. So he's old enough to be fighting in this war. Well, as I said, things would change forever for them. Now they needed weapons, too. They know very quickly that they can't defeat the Mi'kmaq without similar weapons. And where are they going to get them? from the English. <coughs> ah, sorry about the slides. <laughs> um, so I won't go into the whole Popham Colony story, but I think it's really interesting. So if you read the book, I spend a whole chapter on it. Um, but the colony itself was rather doomed to fail for lots and lots and lots of reasons. They came with some, uh, the leaders on the expedition were poorly chosen. They didn't bring enough food with them. Uh, they came with expectations that were incredibly unrealistic. They thought they were gonna find gold, silver, and spices. They really, they expect that the president of the colony wrote back to King James, the indigenous people tell us there's cinnamon and nutmeg here. <laughs> well, okay, I don't know who was pulling whose leg there, but I think it's kind of a funny thing. Um, so, for many reasons, the colony will fail, and they pack up and go home the next year. So that is the fall of 1608. But that's not the end of the English coming to Maine, of course. They come back probably the next year, uh, probably maybe in 1609. Uh, they come back. But the investors who invested in this colony are now have cold feet. They're not interested in spending more money on another failure. So they switched their focus to fishing. They know they can make money at fishing. The fishing here is great. And so fishing boats start to come over the next decade or so. There are fishing boats fishing out of New Harbor, off of Monhegan, Damers Cove, um, and probably many places along the coast. And more and more come every year as you know, the ones come home with their uh, great catch. So this is the beginning of a relationship that the Wawanak and Pemaquid will have with the English. They start to get comfortable with these people. <laughs> they don't feel so threatened because they're not building a colony. They probably only come for like a short period of time, like two or three months to, for the fishing season. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't live ashore, they'd live on their ships. Uh, but they would come ashore because they would need to replenish their water, replenish their firewood. Uh, dry their fish, that's a recreation of a fish uh, flake, it's called, at Pemaquid. So they had to dry their catch, uh, probably did some hunting for some food. And these fishermen wanted to trade with the local people. They knew that if they could bring furs back home, they could make more money on the side. 
And so they were coming ashore. They would bring with them trinkets that, that the native people liked, as well as some metal goods, which they really began to like. Copper kettles were very popular, metal knives, axes, hoes, those things that don't exist in their world, they begin to really treasure. Um, so the fishermen start to bring those things and start to interact with the local people. Uh, and this would have been when Samoset learned to speak English. If there's nothing else you learn today, this is when he learned to speak <coughs> English. Most people think that he was one of the ones that was kidnapped and taken to England, but that's not the case. He learned English from the fishermen. But all of this closeness with them came at a, a huge cost. You've, I'm sure you know about the epidemic that swept through New England among the indigenous people. It was so horrific, it's become known as the Great Dying. Um, took place around 1616, went on for a few years. Now that we've been, or still living in a pandemic, we have maybe a slight inkling what this could have been like. However, I mean, the death toll from COVID has never been more than 4%. It's presumed or estimated that on the coast of Maine, the death toll was probably as high as 75 to 80%. 75 to 80 percent. So there were about 100 people living in Pemaquid, so maybe there were 20 survivors. And if you think about that, out of the 20, how many were grown men who could protect the village? Might have been very, very few. And you add to that the pressure of all of these uh, European fishing ships coming. Well, every ship has at least 15 men on it. Some of them are bigger, have 50 men. Now they're outnumbered. And that's going to color every decision that you make when you know that you are outnumbered by your potential enemy. So there's just so many difficulties here. It's kind of hard to fathom. Uh, it's, it's amazingly hard to imagine what it must have been like when so many people are dying. And you don't know why they are dying. Of course, they didn't know what caused this, this death. We don't know what the disease was, really. Um, could have been more than one, certainly. Could have been. There were so many Europeans coming, it could have been many diseases. They didn't have any immunity to it, and old, young were all dying off. And what made it worse is the Europeans were not dying. They had immunity to it, and so the native people thought that they had angered their great spirit somehow, that their great spirit was striking them dead because he was angry with them, but they didn't know why. Um, and Frankly, the Europeans were kind of happy to uh, exploit that a bit. You know, they would say, yeah, our God is doing this to you. So I, you know, I, I think about the psychological power that must have given them over the native people. And then we have to think about all this loss of um, culture, knowledge, wisdom that died off with those people. Um, indigenous people didn't have written language. Everything was told orally. So those people's stories went with them. I think a lot of history, of their history, was probably lost at this time. So, you know, it's so one tragedy upon another. And not to mention, this is a time when there's such a great displacement of the native people. Because if you're in a village with only a few survivors, you're going to need to go and live with, in a different village. And this is when there's a lot of move in it. It makes it really hard to sort of pinpoint who the tribes were and exactly where they lived because of all of this displacement. So it's, it's a tremendously difficult time uh, in their lives. And it's about this time that Samoset becomes a Sagamore. Um, so that means Tahanado must have died either in the epidemic or the war, we don't know. Um, but he becomes a Sagamore. And then this is when he goes to Plymouth. So oh, another moment is like, what? Wait a minute, what? He left for Plymouth in the summer of 1620. So here he is trying to usher his people through this traumatic period, and he leaves, and he's gone for about a year. What would compel him to do that? Well, I have my theories, which I'll share with you, but it's kind of an extraordinary thing to him, for him to have done. And I didn't realize that when I started this process. I learned so much. But this is when he makes his famous walk into Plymouth Plantation. This is what he's most known for. Um, now, I don't have time to go into the whole Plymouth story, although it's 
not what you learned in school. <laughs> um, but what I'd like to do is just set the scene for you for this walk into the plantation. Because this was an incredibly dangerous moment. And he was so brave to do what he did because he knew about the danger. So the settlers who decided to come to New England, originally they planned to go to New York, but you know, the, the boat didn't go there. <laughs> so they ended up in New England. Um, and they weren't called the pilgrims until much later, so I don't use, actually use that term, I just call them the settlers. The ones who come here are, come here with the expectation that they are coming into a very hostile environment. And that's because there's room, there are rumors circulating in Europe at the time that the indigenous people who live here were all cannibals. Um, now, there's no evidence that the Wawanuk were cannibals. I'm going to put that out there for sure. But this is what they thought. So, you know, probably half the people in this room are descended from some of these settlers. I would imagine maybe some of you are. Uh, we have to give them um, a lot of credit for their bravery for making this trip in the first place. It was a very dangerous trip to, to cross the Atlantic. There were so many shipwrecks at the time. They were coming, they weren't going to be moving into a community already established. They had to do everything themselves. And they thought that they were coming to a very dangerous and hostile place. So, I mean, it's impressive that they would come and bring their wives and children into this situation. So, and only half of them were the religious separatists that you, we think of as the pilgrims today. The other half, uh, we're just people trying to make a better life for themselves. So I think we started with 102 of the settlers. Um, and it would be a very, very difficult year for them. But the first place that they set, sh set their feet on shore was in Outer Cape Cod. And they, that's the first place they land, so they send a scouting party. Let's look for a place to build our settlement. They stay overnight. They wake up in the morning, and they're attacked by the local Wampanoag tribe in Outer Cape Cod, who still live there. They're Nanasset. They shoot arrows at them. The English shoot, shoot their muskets back. And this is known as the First Encounter. Apparently, you can visit First Encounter Beach, which I haven't been to. But um, it's commemorated in that way. But this is the thing our history books never tell us, is that the Nanasset had a really good reason for attacking these men. And the reason was that six years before this, an English ship had come to their shores, and the captain had come ashore, pretended to be friends, done some trading, and then kidnapped several of their people who were never seen again. Now, I don't know about you, but if I saw a, sh a ship come to my shore, I'm not going to let those people <laughs> land either. Now, my feeling is, I, don't, you know, I can't verify this with anybody else, is if, Nobody was killed in that encounter. I feel that if the Nosset had really wanted to kill them, they, they could have, because they were incredibly good marksmen. I think they wanted to scare them off, and that's exactly what they did. The, uh, the settlers realized this is not a good place to settle, so they move on to Plymouth. That's when they go to Plymouth. Now, just, they don't arrive until December. <laughs> yeah, well, so, I mean, it's, it's kind of typical. They don't have enough food. They arrive in the middle of winter. They still have to build all their houses. It's an incredibly hard year, and half of them will die. So I think it's 50, 50 or 51 out of 102 will not make it through the winter. So that's an, it's an incredible. They are so on edge, as you would be. They are often in a situation where there are only like six or seven who are well and are caring for the rest. If the local people, the Wampanoag, had wanted to get rid of them and wipe them out. They could have easily done it. And they, re they realized that. They were so nervous about this that they would bury their dead in the middle of the night in a secret place because they didn't want Native people to see. And they knew there were Native people all around them. All that winter, they could see fires. Sometimes they hear them in the woods, though they never really saw them. They never approached the settlers. Now, I think that's because they were watching them. I think they are wondering, what, what are they doing here? Because this would have been the first time they would have seen women and children on their shores. So this was a different situation. What are they doing here? So they watched them all winter. And then in March, 
Famoset walks right into their settlement, right down the middle of their village, total surprise. He walks toward a group of men. You don't see this in the illustration, but he's carrying a bow and two arrows with him. So he's, he's got weapons. To me, that seems a bit threatening, and I think it's a pretty tense moment. Um, I don't know about you, but if I'm the settlers, I'm thinking, I might shoot on sight. Given everything, all of their nervousness, everything they thought. Um, but Samoset smiles, and waves, and says, welcome, in English. <laughs> you know, I think it's probably the shock that saved his life. <laughs> and he turns out he's the perfect diplomat for this mission. Because I think it is a mission. I think he's been asked by the Wampanoag, who he'd been living with. Um, I think he'd probably been sent in by them. First, because he speaks the language. That's very important. Um, but he's very comfortable with the English. He knows all about them. He's you know, talked to them for years. And he's got the right personality. He's a very friendly guy. He sits down with them for hours and just shoots the breeze. Talk, talk, talk. He answers all their questions. They want to know how many men are there, how many people are there, how many, you know, what strength do they have. They want to, you know, defensive <laughs> questions. And he freely answers. He's not holding anything back. He's establishing this bond of trust with them that is going to be extremely important. He's soothing all their fears. He's the perfect guy. Um, now, he is there to introduce them to the uh, sachem, who is a, is a great leader of the local people, the Wampanoag. This is a man named Usa Miquin. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, but we, we call him Massasoit because the, pil the, the settlers were confused. He, they would hear him referred to that way, but that was actually his title, which means great sachem or great leader. So he's always come down as Massasoit, but uh, his name is actually Usa Miquin. And Usa Miquin wanted to make a relationship or an alliance with these people because he's in the same situation that the Wawanak were in. His people have been decimated by this epidemic. Their neighbors are their enemies. These are the Narragansett people who live in Rhode Island. And so he's at a tremendous disadvantage. And I'm sure he's looking at this that, well, these people have got something that's very useful to us. They have these very, uh, impressive weapons that can help us defeat our enemies, the Narragansett. Maybe better that we make friends with these people than enemies and they can be a useful ally. And this is exactly what he does. So Samoset meets with the, the settlers actually for several days before ever bringing Usumiquin to them. Now, you've probably heard of Squanto or Tisquantum is, how, is his real name. Uh, and you know, he always gets all the credit for this. <laughs> but he hasn't even met these people yet. This is all Samoset. Samoset is laying all the groundwork for this to happen. The first time that Usamequin comes to the village and that they meet, they actually sit down to sign a peace treaty. So all this work has been done ahead of time by Samoset. He's been talking to both sides and he's paved the way. So I, that's another thing I want to leave with you today is just how important his role was. He's never really gotten the credit he deserves for that. So after the treaty is signed, and that is um, in not long after, so maybe in April, uh, we don't hear about Samoset anymore in Plymouth because he's probably gone back to Pemaquid at that point. And now here's my theory as to maybe my, why, he was, why he was there in the first place. And I looked so hard. I really wanted to answer these questions for myself. How did he get to Plymouth? Why did he go? So the next time we hear about Samoset is a couple years later. He's actually written about in another book, which was also new to me. And the um, gentleman who writes the book mentions that he has a wife and a baby boy. So my feeling is that he probably went to find a wife. Now, who knows who the survivors are in Maine at this point, but there may not be a lot of uh, uh, wife material, I guess. And he may have been bringing other people back, too, to help populate, because they've been so depopulated by the epidemic. So anyway, that's my theory. So Sam Exet goes back. He's the Sagamore. He's trying to help his people through the trauma of the epidemic um, and the war. And yet, 
more and more people are coming to his shores. So what's he going to do about that? We have the fishermen that we know about. He's used to them. But now you start to see this other kind of class of people <laughs> who are traders, who are coming specifically to trade for furs. Um, and I put an image of a pirate up there because I really like that image. But um, some of these people sort of behave like pirates. And I don't know if you can read that, but that is a quote by Sir Ferdinando Gorgias, our man from Maine, um, about how some of these people coming to Maine were treating the indigenous people. And it's not really a pretty story. He talks about how they were sleeping with the women, he was teaching them to swear, <laughs> uh, he was teaching them how to drink alcohol. So we see that as early, this is 1624. Uh, cheating them in trade and selling weapons to them. Now by 1624, that's illegal to do. King James had made it illegal in 1622. But these are pirates, you know? Who's gonna stop them? There's no law, no order here. There's no government in Maine. They can do what they want. And what they want is to make money as fast as they can. They're not interested in a relationship here. Uh, they're just trying to make money. And so the, the Wawanak have to learn how to negotiate kind of the good from the bad. But this kind of is, there are many <laughs> episodes, kidnappings and so forth, of moments where they're not treated that well by the European people. And they have long memories of these things. And they will simmer. Um, I don't want you to think that all Europeans coming to this country were bad. They were not. Some were, came here with the intention of settling. Now that's kind of a different story. When you bring your wife and your kids with you and you're going to live on the land and build a farm and you're going to stay here and you're going to live side by side with the indigenous people, you're going to have a different relationship with them. And, um, and they do. And there's a lot of friendship going between the local people and the new settlers. There are lots of um, accounts of them being really welcomed by indigenous people. It's just kind of heartwarming. A little bit heartbreaking at the same time. Um, because things didn't, won't turn out that well in the end. Um, but one of these settlers was John Brown, and you may have heard of John Brown, because he's famous for supposedly buying the whole Pemaquid Peninsula, 120,000 acres or so, from Samoset in 1625. And if that deed is a real valid deed, and that is, then Samoset is, should be noted as the first person, first indigenous person to sell land to Europeans. Not sure that's the thing he would want to be remembered for, but it's out there. Now, I did a lot of looking into that deed. I wanted to know if I could figure out if it really was a forgery. My feeling is that it was. Um, so many red flags. The actual physical deed doesn't appear until 100 years later when his great John Brown's great-grandchildren need to present it to prove that they own the land. Hmm. I don't, there's so many red flags about that deed. Um, but my feeling is that I, I feel that Samoset probably did befriend John Brown because he would live there for years and his, his family, his, um, his daughters and their, their husbands would continue to live on the peninsula for years and years, for the rest of Samoset's life anyway. So I think there was a, a genuine friendship there. And why not? Because there's a lot of land here. There were not very many settlers in the early days. And so there's, there's plenty of room and resources for everybody. And they've got things that they can share, you know, the different skills, different sets of knowledge. And the Wawanak were happy to have people nearby that they could trade with. So before, um, Samoset was paddling to Casco Bay to do trading. That's a long way to go. But now, these settlers would build a trading post right at Pemaquid. And that was certainly a lot more convenient. So, I mean, that's a good reason to welcome them and have them nearby. And it's all kind of good for a while. And then uh, things begin to sour when more and more settlers arrive. And they want more and more land. Because farm, for a big farm, you need a lot of land. But you need even more land to graze your cattle on. I think I've read estimates that you need 10 times as much land to graze your cattle than you do to farm the land. And they brought a lot of cattle. And so they just kept putting pressure on indigenous people to sell your land, sell your land, sell your land. Um, and indigenous people weren't kind of in a position to resist. 
because they're getting caught up in this market economy now. And most especially, they need those weapons. Now, the Mi'kmaq war, Mi war was kind of at an end, although the Mi'kmaq continued to come down the coast and raid until the 1630s. So there was always that threat there. Um, but also by now, they'd, they'd basically given up their bows and arrows for hunting, and they were using guns. So they've kind of become dependent on them at this point. So they kind of needed, they're forced into this relationship with these people, even when things kind of turn a little bit the other way. And we, we go into the next couple of decades, and things just get harder for them. Um, we have another epidemic. <coughs> Sorry, everybody's trying to see the pictures. Another epidemic in 1633, 34 or so, goes through the indigenous population in New England. Don't know how many people died in this one, but we know it was smallpox this time, because there are a lot of English around who can identify it. And it's just as devastating as the first time. Um, People are dying, indigenous people are dying, but not the Europeans, again. And if you did survive, you could often end up with these horrific scars, like you see in the picture, or sometimes um, it would cause blindness. So that would be d just debilitating. So another horrendous uh, moment in their lives. Um, again, they're losing uh, you know, the, the people, their knowledge, the wisdom. And again, they're, they're having sort of a spiritual crisis, I think. Um, why is their great spirit doing this and the English God not, uh, not doing this to the English? And this was, at a, this was a time when the Europeans really worked hard to convert indi indigenous people to Christianity, um, and some probably did at this point. And then by the 1640s, there are some accounts by, you know, that are um, quoted from indigenous people, the fact that they can't find animals to hunt anymore. Already, so soon, they have overhunted the animals. Now, this was never their practice before Europeans came here. They lived sustainably on this land. They would always leave enough for the next day, the next generation. You never overhunted your resources. Um, it was a tremendously sustainable way of life. And yet, they've gotten caught up in this kind of European model of market economy and they have overhunted. So this is going to cause them tremendous stress because, you know, once they don't have land to sell and they don't have furs to trade, they're not of much use to the Europeans anymore. And that puts them at a really difficult position, which may have been what led to a, a rather large use of alcohol, <coughs> unfortunately. And I hated to even put this in my book. I didn't think I was going to have to write about alcohol, because we know that this still plagues them today. Um, but it's an <coughs> unfortunate part of the story. We saw it in Sir Ferdinando's quote, they are plying them with alcohol. And this was a really something that was done by a lot of the Europeans. They would push alcohol on the Europeans. It made it easier to cheat them. Um, or you could get one drunk and get him to sign a land deed. Or you could get him to run up debt at the trading post, and the only way he would have to pay that off would be to sell land. So it was a tool, ma uh, manipulation, um, and it would be very devastating, unfortunately, to the native people. Um, so they're, they're going through all of these hardships. And, and here in this area, 1635, there's a, tr there's a huge hurricane. You, you know, if you've been down to Pemaquid, you see the plaque, the hurricane of 1635, which was worse th than anybody had ever seen before. So it just seems like it's one thing after another, these pressures that mount on them. And um, in fact, there's a talk f among the English. You'll see it in the journals. John Winthrop in Boston's even writing about it. There's this talk, there's going to be an uprising. The native people are going to rise up against us. They're all upset. Well, yes, they are upset. <laughs> um, but somehow this fizzles out. And that's 1642 that we hear about that. But things are just simmering under the surface. And it's probably just as well that Sam said doesn't live to see it. Um, he probably died in 1653 or so. He signed a couple of deeds that year that we know of. So uh, if so, he would have been 63, which is kind of extraordinary, considering everything he lived through, at least two epidemics, war, um, a ch complete change in his life. Uh, so he probably died around 1653. 
And we don't know where he's buried. There's some talk that he's buried out on Louds Island because there is an indigenous burial ground out there that washed up in one hurricane one time. But we don't, I don't, we'll never know. I don't think we'll ever know where he is specifically. But what an extraordinary life that he had. And think of what he saw during his lifetime, a complete upheaval in the way that indigenous people lived. You know, he started life as a hunter-gatherer who probably uh, used a beaver tooth to, to make a bowl to eat from. And, you know, it was a migratory life. They would move inland, they would go up river in the winter, the hunting was better, and on the coast in the summer. All of that would change by the end of his life. Extraordinary time. Um, and things would just go downhill from there. Um, the first war will break out in 1675. Starts in Massachusetts, that's King Philip's War. Philip was Usamequin's son. That peace treaty held throughout Usamequin's life, which was until like 1660 or so. So about 40 years they managed to keep the peace. And I think Usamequin probably had a big um, role in that. I think Samoset probably learned a lot of diplomatic skills from him. He was always sort of a peacemaker. But after his death, you've got just more English coming here more pressure to move them off their lands. Um, there was no interest in having a relationship with the indigenous people. They thought of them as inferior. And indigenous people were tired of being treated that way. And they were tired of the fact that they had to follow English law, but they didn't receive English justice in the courts as a result. They were just, you know, it's death by a thousand cuts. He's just, you know, it's one thing after another. And they finally, now that they've come together in that alliance, the Wabanaki sort of alliance, now they're strong when they're together. And they fight back. Um, and they do this in 1675. Um, and in fact, in Maine, the first two wars, King Philip's War, King, Will King William's War, the indigenous people win those wars in Maine. They are so successful, they burn Pemaquid to the ground in each war, and they drive English people almost completely out of the state. I mean, I think they're, they're only, like, Wells is like the, as far as they dri drive them out. But the English come in, you know, keep coming in great numbers um, from England, and it's just an onslaught they can't push back. Now, the map on the right, if you can see past my head, um, kind of shows you the movement of people during these wars. And this explains a lot because, as I said, the Abenaki live, were living in English territory. And those are the people you see who are being moved off the land. Those tribes that lived in French territory got along with the French. The French were willing, a little bit more willing to work with them and live with them. And so the Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, Micmac, they live on part of their ancestral homelands today, only part but they were not completely displaced like these Abenaki tribes were. As you can see, they would move north, sort of during the war when they were being attacked, they would move out of the region. We know that the Wawanok, a lot of them moved up to a, um, a reservation that the French created up in Canada. And um, I think there are still descendants up there today. But a lot of them either moved north or they uh, moved in with some of the other tribes because they probably had family members who were uh, Penobscot or Passamaquoddy, and they might assimilate there. But always they kept coming back, trying to win, you know, trying to defeat the English and get their land back. But they were fighting a losing battle because the English had a, had a special policy. And these were scalp bounties. This isn't even in my book because I learned about this after the book went to the publisher. <laughs> so I, I was kind of um, shocked and surprised to learn about these scalp bounties that were put on indigenous people's heads. I know we think of it being the other way, but the English governments throughout these periods of war were, they proclaimed 79 times at least that anybody who would go out and find a, a, a Wabanaki person, they could capture them for one price or bring in their scalp for only a slightly lower price. Uh, and it was a lot of money. Um, so that it was basically a genocidal onslaught of vigilantes going out to kill anybody, including children. There was a price on the kids' heads 
It was a certain price for a child under the age of 12. Um, and for a man, I think the, the bounty price was 50 pounds, which is about $10,000. And if you were going to get the price for the living captive, you had to bring him to Boston. So that's a long way, but you'd still get 40 pounds if you brought in his scalp. So I suspect it was more scalps than living captives. And the price, I think, for women and children was something like 20 or 25 pounds. So still a lot of money. It's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> David Cardinal right here in Newcastle was known for scalping. There were people in Newcastle who are known for, yeah. It would be really interesting to see lists of the colonists who brought in scalps. It's a, I'm a little afraid to see that because probably many of my ancestors were <laughs> on that list. Um, but, you know, it's out there. So we, uh, I haven't seen that yet, and I would, love to, I would actually be really interested to learn that. And I, I've got another little film to highlight for you. It's called Bounty. Uh, it's only nine minutes long. It's very short. I know it played on main public television, but I do have a link for you to get there. And this is how the Penobscot people are teaching their children this history. It's a story of some Penobscot parents who take their children to Boston, to the old state house, where those bounty proclamations were originated, and they tell them about them. It's pretty, it's kind of hard to watch. It's very moving that these children have to be told that people would put, a, you know, a bounty on their heads. But it's important to know. You know, the Penobscot are being very brave to teach this. And, you know, we need to be working from the same set of facts, I think. I think, I think our kids can handle this. Yes. It's not a pretty history. It's a painful history. But I think they'd rather know the truth. Um, and I think if you're here, you probably want to know the truth as well. Um, and it's okay. You know, um, I don't think we have to feel the guilt of our ancestors, but I think it's incumbent upon us to learn this history and listen. And um, that's the only way that really we can go forward together. Um, and the Wabanaki are trying to teach us this. And I think, I think we're at a point in time where we're ready to listen. Um, and I think that they would want you to know the things that, I, you know, I, people ask me, well, what, what would the Wabanaki want to say to us now? Well, they want to tell you that they're still here, that they have survived. You know, it, I hate to say this, but growing up in this area, I never thought about indigenous people because they didn't live here to make me think about them. I don't know. I guess I thought they were extinct or something because who knew? I didn't even know the story and nobody talked about it. Um, I think they would like you to talk about it and learn about it and, um, and, and recognize that that's the only way that we can learn to respect what they've been through, um, to respect their culture. Um, and maybe help them gain the sovereignty that they are trying to gain. You've probably heard a lot about that in the news, um, so that they can just govern themselves. It's not like they're asking for a lot. They just want to be treated with respect. Um, and so I think that's important for us. And then one of the last things I'll say is that, you know, we've been talking about Samoset and his story today. But the thing that's interesting is that his story is so similar, I think, to what other indigenous tribes went through all over this country. You know, you, seem to seem, you see those same patterns of, you know, this maybe originally good meetings or good feelings and how everything just kind of devolves into sort of greed for the land and so forth. So I think his kind of, his story is every man's story when it comes to indigenous people. I think that's why it's important to learn about it. Plus I think it's very important because I live here anyway. Um, and I wrote a book about it. <laughs> I told you I would tell you how to get to those links, the TED Talk by Mark Charles and the film Bounty. You can find them on my website, which is jodybatchelder.com. If you look under resources, uh, I've put a bunch of resources, books, websites, other things, and films that I think are really interesting, and there are links to both of those. So my god, you made it, you all made it through. I'm so <laughs> impressed. <laughs> Woo! Hats off to you. <laughs> Thank you for listening. I hope you have questions. Before we get into that, um, <laughs> I just want to make a note. Um, you're talking about the 1635 hurricane that struck mm. Pemaquid. It was probably 
equivalent to the 1938 New England, Great New England hurricane that killed over 600 people. But uh, back to that, Governor Winthrop mentions in his journal about the hurricane, he says, no one died, there's a lot of destruction, no one died except for five Indians. Yeah. And that was, the, that was the mindset back then. Yes, yes. Back. And he talks about how um, they climbed the trees to survive. Interesting yeah. thought. And here's another interesting little thought about that. In my, in my book originally, I wrote about that hurricane and I said something like, uh, and their, their village must have been destroyed by this hurricane. And one of the historians who read the manuscript says, oh no, Jody, <laughs> not necessarily. He said, the, and um, he was referring to some of the, um, the native um, buildings at Plymouth. And he said, those have survived hurricanes. So it's not necessarily true that their wigwams uh, were, were devastated. So I thought, well, that's an interesting fact. So a lot of things that I just made assumptions about but weren't necessarily true. So, oh, and I have to point out Mrs. Day here because if this book is no good, I'm going to blame that on her because she was my sixth grade English teacher. <laughs> so do you have a question, Mrs. Day? <laughs> do you have your book here to sell? I do. Yes. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> and I have a box full if anybody wants one. Woohoo! We uh, understood. We did a little history project with Dan Roscano. Uh, do you want to? He wants to get your. Do you want me to put this up to? Oh, no. Yeah. Can you just hear her? We just understood that there were some people along the coast, maybe in the York area, who actually were trying to heal the Indians. But they, the Native Americans, but they couldn't, he, you know, during the pandemic, oh. or they, that, that they really tried, but there was no way to help them. And of course, the white people did not get sick at right. all. Right, right. And there were, the, there's a wonderful account in William Bradford's journal that he wrote. William Bradford ended up being the governor of Plymouth. And he mentions, this is the 1633 pandemic, or epidemic. And he talks about how some of those settlers try their best to help. They bring them food. Um, they're, they're just prostrate, they can't move, and the settlers come and try to take care of them, mm -hmm. which is just, that's heartwarming. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, wants to highlight their, um, their good deeds and their good work, they're good Christians. Um, but, you know, they are, I don't think we can imagine, we get sick today, but the sickness that they experienced, the descriptions, you know, the skin just peeling off their backs and things, you know, it was hard to survive that. Mm -hmm. And, and the English people didn't have good medicine or tools or uh, they didn't know what caused smallpox in the 1630s. So really difficult thing to deal with. They used their advantage later on though with blankets and the, when they moved out west. <laughs> yeah, they yeah. They purposely uh, gave them disease. Yeah, and, and uh, Massachusetts, Jeffrey Amherst, which is why, why Amherst College has changed their mascot. They used to be the Fighting Jeffreys mm -hmm. and Jeffrey Amherst was actually a general, I think, um, who used as a tactic against the indigenous people, give them smallpox-ridden blankets. Oh. So that's not a pretty story either. <laughs> so we have more questions? I didn't talk about everything today, so yes, sir. Of the five, of the five original kidnappees, what happened to them? Mm. Oh, I could talk about that for a long time. <laughs> he asked about the other, the other kidnappees. What an interesting story that was. Um, so as I said, three kidnapped men are left in Plymouth, and two go on to London. Uh, one of them, whose name was Amoret, and some people think that was Samoset because the name is a little bit similar, but we don't hear about Amoret anymore. I think he probably died very quickly. You know, there were a lot of disease. The plague had just been through uh, London. Um, in 1603, and they were there in 1605. So, I mean, he probably got a disease and died, very, I assume, fairly quickly. Um, Tahanado was in a really interesting spot living in London with Sir John Popham, because he's there during a, a moment in history that, you know, still lives on today, uh, which was um, a bunch of Catholic noblemen decide they're going to blow up Parliament and get rid of King James and, and all the Protestants. So they make this plan to um, put dynamite under, uh, <laughs> in the basement of, of the building where Parliament is held. They know that the, the king and his wife and his family, whole family, comes on opening day, and they're going to blow it up. 
And the guy who's going to do this is a guy named Guy Fox. You ever hear of Guy Fox? That's actually where that term Guy comes from. <laughs> come from Guy Fox. Um, and sort of just luckily, Guy Fox is discovered the night before, kind of guarding <laughs> the explosives that he has brought in. He's like the He's the only one who's not a nobleman because he knows about weaponry or explosives. So he's discovered. And somebody asked him you know, he's, uh, why he brought so many explosives. It was way more than he needed to blow up this building. He said, I wanted to blow that bugger all the way back to Scotland. Um, so that's the, the hatred that they had for the Protestants. It's always the Catholic Protestant problem. So anyway, uh, and the man who oversees the trial of all these men who are caught is Sir John Popham, and that's who Tahanado lives with. So he's there to witness this incredible moment of history. And what's also interesting about that is that killing your king or your leader was so foreign to them because they chose their leaders based on their skills, and um, they had a great respect for their leaders. And to see that the English would, would try to kill their leader was, that must have been monumental. So um, as I said, one of the others does make it home. Two of the, uh, of the captives are put on a ship uh, in 1606 to come back. They're, they're meant to come back to the colony, to build the colony. But the captain of that ship decides to take the southern route. <coughs> don't really know why. Um, when Sir Ferdinando Gorges actually told him, you need to go north because the Spanish are in the south, and yet that's where they go. Some think that they were looking for plunder because those ships that the Spanish were sending home were full of gold and silver. So they were hoping to do a little piracy maybe on the side. Well, they got in trouble because one morning, it's a foggy morning, I love this story, they wake up, and when the fog clears, they're surrounded by like eight Spanish ships. <laughs> And that's a problem. <laughs> so the Spanish and, and the Spanish and the English and the French are so often at war with one another. But this is actually a moment where they're not at war. They had just signed a peace treaty like two, two years before this. And, uh, but the Spanish are not having that. They are tired of all these English pirates. And they board the ship, and they seize the ship, and they take all the people um, back to Spain. And we know that, and it's so in, uh, it was so cool to find these letters that were written by the captain of the ship. For some reason, he's not put in prison, but everybody else was. And he's writing back to Sir Ferdinando Gorgias about what's happening with these prisoners. And he's talking about how badly they're being treated. But the two native men are treated differently. For some reason, the Spanish are trying very hard to convert them to Christianity. Not exactly sure why. Uh, but they are taken off to be slaves at one point which probably means, because slavery in those days was probably uh, rowing in the galleys. You know, if you've seen those like, horrible old movies where they're down the bowel of a ship and they're just strapped to the oars and that's what they So that may have been their fate. Um, and one of them, we are pretty sure, probably dies in that prison. Um, the other one survives all of that. He was attacked on the ship by the Spanish, was, was wounded badly, survived the wounds, survived Spanish prison, survived Spanish slavery, and makes it back to Sir Ferdinando. Incredibly. Now, I don't know exactly what happens to him, although it seems like he was brought back to this country, but to Massachusetts. And then we don't hear about him anymore. He may have, he may have died of a disease at that point. But uh, their stories are just so, and thank you for asking that. That may be more than you want to know, but I just thought, I thought those stories were really interesting. So, more questions? Everybody's thinking about the food over there? Uh, uh, on that note. You can always ask me or um, um, email me. You can get to me through my website if you want to send me an email. I'd be happy to answer any more questions. Thanks so much for coming today. That was a lot of history. <laughs> Scott, Historical Society, Newcastle Historical Society, and Coastal Rivers really appreciate you coming to give this talk. Um, we have a lot of plethora of food over here, as you can see, and there's also a donation jar. We always encourage people if they'd like to put it toward the Historical Society. We'd appreciate it very much.
Coastal Rivers Conservation Trust. Located at the Round Top Farm in Damariscotta, the mission of Coastal Rivers Conservation Trust is to care for the lands and waters of the Damariscotta Pemaquid region by conserving special places, protecting water quality, creating trails and public access, and deepening connections to nature. Coastal Rivers Conservation Trust. CoastalRivers.org.